What does one call a dinosaur after a breakup? A Tyrannosaurus X. Get it? <laughs> if you're a Jurassic Park movie star like moi, you tend to get a lot of those. Call me, ladies. I'm single again. Mwah. Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. Today, my first acquisition of 2024, a very special watch. OG's original Gentry members will remember this one. I'm actually buying it back. Oh, and by the way, I did have to sell a Tudor as part of the blood in, blood out policy to buy this watch. I'll reveal which Tudor later on. That's the clickbait title for you. I sold the Tudor to buy a Tissot. I'll do a quick wristwatch check. Wearing the Panerai, a one year anniversary already, I think, with this watch. Still absolutely adore it. On the Wrist Candy Watch Club rubber waffle strap there. Again, a year with this combination. Didn't expect it. A lot of people thought, oh, I'm gonna fall out of love with it, get bored of it, but no, we are still here. It's a year already. That's crazy. Anyway, let's get into it. Now, I've been extremely critical of modern Tissot in recent years. The curse of starting to know too much on how the industry really works, and perhaps also the mistake of caring too much. I made several videos about it, so before you call me out on this complex subject, please refer to everything said collectively, and I stress collectively in those previous episodes. But today's watch is seriously grail material. But first, some context to fully understand its significance, especially as while I'm writing this script, they just released a gorgeous new 70s styled racing chrono that honors a very much underappreciated heritage in this genre, or should I say complication. Now we will return to talking about that later on. Tissot holds a very special place in my heart, as it was the first Swiss-made watch I ever owned that wasn't a plastic swatch. Being predominantly a Seiko citizen and Casio wearer in my teens and childhood. It was the PRS 200 Quartz Chrono, gifted to me by my father. And I owned this during that transitional period as I struggled from a naive, confused student too penurious and even more confused intern during the first tentative baby steps to hopefully something called employment in the big unforgiving apple. So fast forward donkey's years of shattered dreams, horrible bosses, <laughs> uh, failed career attempts. When I did occasionally have some success and some disposable income you could say and I wasn't splurging it on video games and sneakers, I started buying my first serious watches like Amiga, Oris, Rolex, that kind of thing. Oh, and my first mechanical Tissot. So I began sharing my experiences via rudimentary and painfully embarrassing videos on this newfangled thing called YouTube almost a decade ago. Back then, there was literally only a handful of watch geeks on here. Kind of funny to think, it was almost something to be ashamed of. Like being called a Trekkie in the schoolyard, when all one wanted to do was hang around the cool kids. Where am I going with all this? Well, during these early days of the channel, I picked up a neo-vintage Tissot Chrono, not knowing just how revolutionary it was for the time. Well, today, I'm buying it back. So this is a long time coming. I've got to give a massive shout out to my good friend Matt out there who I am uh, purchasing this off. And we've <laughs> gone back back and forth for donkey, it seems like donkey's years. I mean, I know he, um, he's supported the channel for a very long time. I know you're watching this, so thank you so much, my friend, and especially for the support. So here we go. I'll do a quick knife check as we're unboxing an incredibly gorgeous watch. Well, I hope it is. <laughs> 
I'm using the Layol from, uh, this is the real Layol uh, from the genuine, I can't remember if it's a town or city in France. Uh, it has to be a bit like Champagne. It has to be from the Champagne region to be real Champagne. The same goes for Layol. So let's make the first incision. <laughs> Now, as this does not come with the box and papers, there are still a few, I think on Chrono24, not so much on eBay these days, which is a bit strange. Uh, this does not come with the box and papers, so it's just the watch. I'm gonna do the drum roll. Oh, there it is, there it is. Cut it there. There we go. Oh, oh my God, look at that. Oh my God, look zoom in look at that dial that is beautiful so this i presume matt got aftermarket it does work with the the beads of rice there we go look at that and yes an actual regulator you can regulate yourself let's zoom out let's wind it up this is a manual wind obviously oh i remember this i remember how it feels when you wind it up is it plexiglass i can't remember but yeah, pretty good condition. Yeah, the, the sides look good. Brushing looks good. I mean, I can always give it a nice little polish, the, the glass. This brings back memories. I love that onion crown. The, oh, and the old school T logo. So what's so special about this watch, aside from it being drop dead gorgeous, obviously? This was released in the mid 1990s, a more innocent age before the watch world went online back when the internet was still seen with a Scully and Mulder-like mix of skepticism, suspicion, wonderment and fear. A new frontier of Windows 95, Macintosh OS and AOL messengers, two decades before my own very first cringiante video making coffee with Lavazza in a diminutive kitchen in Queens. Today, every cash-grabbing fake watch publication pumps out endless limited editions, just as desperately as the watch brands themselves. However, this Tissot was doing it in a time when it was honestly to make a timepiece actually exclusive and collectible, not just profitable. Watch journalism was still genuine then, and not the duplicitous facade it has become, that simply advertises their own watch store, and worse, with endless oleaginously paid opinions, <coughs> sorry, I mean articles. But aside from how it was sold, the Tissot's design was also 30 years ahead of the vintage-inspired trend, a trend that unquestionably has dominated current watch design and marketing. The attention to detail was extraordinary. There was even faux aging on the anachronistic date wheel to match the intricately Dijon mustard gilt printing and gold tone of the leaf style hands. Now, going forward, you might notice I've put uh, the Spoleto uh, Colareb from Holbens. I've actually got a new bracelet from Holbens. I'll share that maybe on Instagram or in a future video. But I just think this, this is a winning combination, this uh, beautiful luxury Italian Vera pelle, tutto fatto a mano in Italia. Uh, ten years later, still the best luxury handmade straps in the biz. Its modest scale and 37 mm diameter size was as if it was straight from the 1930s Art Deco era, of which it inspired its aesthetics with such an unrelenting commitment. However, this was decades before the likes of Longines, Dan Henry, Baltic, Amiga, Laurier, and so many others made their own odes to honoring this more elegant age. But Tissot had one more profound reason to recreate this watch, beyond the mere appreciation of the past. It honors a specific historic collaboration between Tissot and Amiga, one that put Tissot on the map for being one of the best Swiss chronograph makers of the early 20th century. And in the last 60 days of 1930, 600 banks closed their doors. By December, industrial production had fallen by 30% in the USA, 25% in Germany, 30% in Britain. 5 million were unemployed in America, 4.5 million in Germany, 2 million in Britain. This bromance between giants of Swiss horology was in order to combine resources, 
following the 1929 global financial collapse. This enabled them to produce competitively top-tier products during a desperately challenging time for the watch industry. In particular, the 33.3 multi-scale chronographs of which the 3,333 limited amount of this modern 90s reinterpretation poetically references. But unlike those chronos of the 30s, they added several prescient features that have become commonplace today, including the recent PR516 release. They added a displayback to show off the modified manual wind Valju 7765. Essentially a rotorless 7750, this also allowed it to be slimmer with a period correct height, unlike the oversized Cicciotto almost 14mm of their 2023 release, the 1938 10 This showing off of the customised movement was rarely done in the 90s. And as my PRS200 watch I once owned, that I talked about earlier, demonstrates, this was during a time utterly dominated by quartz at the entry level. But there's one fascinating plot twist to the story behind this watch, and that is why is it called Janeiro, the Portuguese for the month of January, and of course the city of Rio in Brazil. But it's also got something to do with that. The 1929 crisis shatters the belief in the ability of a liberal economic system based on mobility and trade. In fact, it plays in the hand of the enemies of liberalism, both on the left and the right. The Amiga Tissot co-signed telemeter chronos became important beyond the obvious historic co-branding because of their use by various militaries around the world, but in particular being the choice of Italian pilots in several historic transatlantic flights. The first was the 1930 flight of an armada of 12 Savoia Marchetti S55 flying boats from Italy to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil between the 17th of December 1930 and yes you've guessed it arriving on January 15th 1931 and this was done using one of the coolest and most unique aircraft of all time with its double hull two inline contra rotating propellers mounted in tandem that set 14 world records for speed altitude and distance with the payload but this particular voyage was led by the debonair champion aviator, decorated war hero, black shirt politician and the general of the Italian Air Force at the time, Italo Balbo himself, thus invariably leading these chronos to be nicknamed after him, as he wore an earlier mono-pusher variation. But so would avoid association with this controversial figure, despite Balbo's virulent stance against the Italian Pact of Steel alliance with Germany later during wartime, along with him being fiercely in opposition to the persecution of Italy's Jewish population once the nation became too entangled with the evils of the Third Reich. New York gave General Balbo and his Italian flyers a roaring welcome as they paraded up Broadway in traditional style amid a hail of paper. Thousands lined both sides of the street, from the Battery to City Hall, and cheered the smiling general as he passed by. In fact, many suspected his untimely accidental death by friendly fire in 1940 during a flight headed for the Libyan airfield of Tobruk was actually an assassination due to his popularity and increasing rivalry with the fascist leader Mussolini. Tissot therefore settled on the more neutral Janeiro. The etymology of that particular month was in honour of the Roman god Janus, who is symbolic of beginnings and endings, as well as, rather fittingly, new gates and doorways during voyages. 
Speaking of the gods, like a divine sign from the horological heavens, this not only arrived the same day as my birthday, but the same day I received this gift, honoring a very important building, a part of my family's history, also from the 1930s. This stunning limited edition collectible plate and artwork honors Frognall 66 in London a renowned and highly acclaimed modernist house that was designed by Connell, Ward and Lucas for and with my British grandfather, GHW, completed also in the 1930s. This revolutionary building for the time further cemented, forgive my pun there, <laughs> my admiration for my grandfather. Not only the definitive ideal of a true gentleman, along with a respect for his classic stylish tastes, cultured intellect, autodidactic refinement, and obviously his prescient keen eye in understanding design before everyone else. A monument manifested in stone and iron as a historic landmark that would live on far beyond him. Like my grandfather, Italy of the pre-World War II era was utterly obsessed with modernism. So much so they had their own movement, Futurism, which was a kind of, I guess, reaction or uh, their spin on it. And during that time, the most expressive of technology and the future was the ancestors of the Gennaro. So it's very much part of that legacy. The awkward truth, habitually ignored or denied by those who associate progressive architecture with democratic governance, is that much that was built in totalitarian Italy between 1922 and 1943 was at the very forefront of modernism. Unlike Art Deco, which today has become more synonymous with Gatsbyan depictions of grandiose opulence, modernism and futurism did not seek to merge man and technology into a transhumanist metropolis-like utilitarian ideal for the unwashed masses and separately decadent luxury for the ruling rich. They did, however, combine into the second wave of Italian futurism, producing technophilic imagery, preoccupied with flight in particular, more than any other depiction of the future. You see, aviation to them is what Star Trek must seem to us now. And therefore, symbolism of the all-seeing pilot, a god with the world beneath him, technology in the form of a wristwatch or airplane as his tools to be used like Thor's hammer or Zeus's thunderbolt. The now miniaturized earth below a target for his mercy. Fortuitously, in a fitting cyclical nature, we've returned to the very object I started this channel with, the Bialetti Macchinetta. And I think it also demonstrates, like the watches, like the architecture of that period, that not everything from the 1930s uh, in Italy was, was bad. We the futurists glory in danger. We exalt war. War is the hygiene of the world. This Zarathustrian Ubermensch demagoguery obsession with empowerment and aspiration was infused into the meaning. One echoed in the sine qua non of propaganda language in almost every autocratic megalomaniacal regime, no matter if it was with stars, sickles or swastikas. It stood for, or was at least intellectually linked, to the machine, to man as a machine cog, to the suppression of the individual, to collectivity, discipline, submission to the state, and the doctrines of Taylorism and Fordism. Today, the antiquated spiral telemeter complication that was used predominantly in war to calculate artillery now serves a new purpose, a mesmeric web to entangle your intrigue. To evoke nostalgia for a past age when mechanical timing was still cutting-edge tech and could determine the success of a maneuver in battle, and thus the outcome of a war, and therefore the future. 
Now, does the case look a little bit familiar to you guys? Well, that's because the 33.3 Chronos were produced for about 20 years, and they are the platform of which Amiga would base their designs for the Speedmaster two decades later. So it's often referred to as the pre-Speedmaster. Amazing to think that without this collaboration with Tissot and Amiga, the Speedmaster might never have taken this shape. So very, very cool indeed. Today, Tissot are very much trying to bring this legacy of making great chronographs back with the more modern, mainstream Daytona-like appeal, and rightfully so. But it all started with their golden era of watchmaking, the ancestors of the Janeiro. A story I'm sure most watch YouTubers will simply gloss over, or not even discuss with their unfortunate, philistinistic understanding of our beloved hobby. But the entire watch industry too could have learned so much from this watch. A good honest limited edition, without any cost cutting or modulized difficult to regulate movements, its strengths are derived from the merits of its tastefully nuanced design, heritage, quality and fair value. So what Tudor did I sell as part of my blood in blood out policy? Well, I have to admit, this was a painful one, I can't deny it but my stunning champagne dial 36mm Prince Date Day that I acquired last year. Now you guys know I absolutely love that watch, but having the Rolex Linen Dial Day Date and being relatively easy to rebuy, unlike the Tissot, it was a worthy sacrifice in my opinion. And if you didn't know, well you certainly know now that this is exactly my cup of tea, or should I say espresso. But my Tudor Submariner still remains to tick that brand box, so it's not completely over for me and Tudor just yet. So there we have it guys, let me know your thoughts in the comments. A sense of balance restored here, chuffed a bit, over the moon and all of the rest of it. Do let me know your favourite Tissots, what do you think of their new Tissot, where they're going, what you'd like to see from them. Also don't forget to like this video, especially if you want to see more free and independent content like this. I'll catch you in the next one. Onwards and upwards. Ciao.